Um, okay, so we've already heard quite a bit um, about um, some of the ways in which we're trying to do away with species as considerations, considerations that are based on uh, species um, it's as something morally important or morally relevant. Um, yesterday, uh, Peter Singer compared speciesism to racism and sexism. And one of the things that's uh, similar about the prejudice that speciesism uh, represents is that it is a prejudice based on a, what's usually called a morally irrelevant characteristic. And one of the mechanisms, one of the ways uh, that people have tried to um, move away from that prejudice is by extending or expanding the circle of moral concern. Um, and so, um, that's not how that goes. That's not how that goes. There we go. Um, okay, so one of the ways that um, we have historically moved out from me at the center um, to think about I matter morally, my family matters morally, my tribe matters morally, my sex or gender matter morally, my race, my nation, and ultimately my species. Um, and so there's this notion that we expand the circle outward um, and in expanding the circle outward, we get away from speciesism or what's been called um, human exceptionalism or ho human normativity, which is related to questions about homonormativity. Um, and one of the main strategies that's been used, um, and it's um, been mentioned already and it will be mentioned extensively after lunch today, is to draw on empirical research that's designed to show that other than human animals have capacities or traits um, that are similar or the same as those in the moral center, right? And so there's what I call a sameness approach to our um, moral expansion. We will expand outwards as long as we can recognize what are called morally relevant similarities between sort of those at the center and others. And we're basically, the reason that we want to look at the uh, ways in which individuals matter when they're the same is we see it in ourselves. We say, I really think it's important for me to be rational or caring or autonomous or uh, sentient, and insofar as others are similar to me in that way, similar to me in that having those capacities, um, then those bodies also matter, even if those bodies are very different from my body in many ways. As long as they have those capacities, those that's what matters from a moral point of view. And so this is what I call the sameness strategy. And I myself have drawn in my work um, on um, feminist care tradition and ethics, um, animal ethics more broadly, certainly in my book, Ethics and Animals, I've drawn on the ways in which other animals are similar to us. Now, my way of looking at our, those similarities tend not to focus on the canonical categories of sort of rationality or necessarily autonomy, um, but also on the idea that other animals have rich social relationships, that they often sacrifice their own safety in order to stay with sick or injured family members so that the fatally ill or dying won't die alone. They also grieve their dead. I'm interested in the ways in which other animals are similar to us in the, when they respond emotionally to the emotional states and the emotional stresses and distress of others. There also, um, there's fascinating observational work that's been done. Um, do you think I should just wait for a second? No. People are sort of trailing in. Okay, everybody can get to you. Um, so, um, so there's a variety of ways that we might draw on this sameness approach. Um, animals, as I was saying, they grieve their dead, they respond to emotions in others, they engage in norm-governed behavior, they manipulate, they deceive, um, they pass along culture. So there's all of these ways that the capacities, whatever capacities they might be, that we find morally important 
um, and valuable in ourselves and have traditionally or historically been used to distinguish humans from other animals have actually been observed to varying degrees and in elaborately different forms in the non-human world as well. Um, and so given that we're implored as human rational beings to be um, consistent and to be fair in our, um, in our thinking, we ought to extend the concern that we have for each other to other animals if they have the kinds of capacities that we find so valuable and important in ourselves. Okay. So um, that is, in a nutshell, what, the same, what I call the sameness approach. That's what the sameness approach is. And I also want to say something important about the sameness approach, and that is that it has a motivational power to it when we recognize the connection um, with others, and we recognize similarities with others, we tend to want to engage and identify and empathize and protect those others. Now, having said all of that, um, as I said, I've used the sameness strategy myself. I think there's important ways in which the sameness strategy um, is um, helpful. Um, I also want to say that there needs to be significant caution. And so what I want to talk about today is three cautions about this extensionist approach. Okay, so that, so just keep in mind that I, I'm not trying to dismantle the sameness strategy, but I think that there are really deep and very potentially problematic issues with the sameness strategy, and so I want to just highlight those. Now, one of those strategies is, one of those, sorry, one of those, um, traps is what I'm going to call a rhetorical trap, or it's a caution um, that I wanted to raise in connection with trying to expand our concerns about humans and per human persons outward, okay? And this is, some of you may be aware, uh, this is Heisel, Matthew Heisel Pan, in fact, who was one of the very first chimpanzees um, for whom um, advocates tried to get legal rights. and. Um, what, this was in Austria. Uh, the details of the case were, um, aren't really that important for us right now, but th I'm just wanting to raise this um, case. It failed, the case failed. Um, but I wanted to raise the case um, because of the rhetoric that was going on at the time. And I think um, Steve, and Steve Wise and Lori Marina will be talking a lot in a bit after lunch about the case that's just been raised this week. Um, and I th I can, you can already see the rhetoric happening in that, in this, the, the dangerous rhetoric in this case happening as well, um, in the comment sections of any of the articles that have been, um, the media has been amazing, and, and any of the articles, you can look at the, any comment section and you can find exactly this concern that I'm raising right now. And that is this confusion that gets very much taken up um, between sort of the notion of human and the notion of personhood. And uh, Peter talked a little bit about this, um, last night, but basically human, the word human, the idea of the human has two senses. One is the biological and empirical. You can tell a human is a human by their genome or by their parentage. Um, and in that case, you can go out and check it. You can find out whether or not an individual is a human. The other is that um, is more metaphorical. And this is, again, this is something that Peter raised last night, um, this idea that somehow you need to act with humanity. So there's something um, that is normative about it or ethical about it. And so in that sense, when somebody is being inhuman or lacks their humanity, you're not saying they're no longer a human being in the biological sense. What you're saying is they're violating certain kinds of cultural or ethical expectations or norms, right? And personhood, as we've heard already, is similar to the second sense of the human. Um, and this is often where the confusion comes about. So personhood is not empirical, personhood is uh, as some might say, prescriptive, it's normative, it's ethical, it's conceptual. And so what happens is that sometimes people confuse persons and humans and think, well, what's going to happen? What are we doing now? What's next? And really worry that if we extend uh, personhood beyond the human, that we're somehow going to diminish humanity. And that was what was happening in, uh, in part, the rhetoric in um, the Austrian case. Now, that's a confusion that can be easily remedied by being careful about making distinctions 
And it's important to do it not just in this kind of formal setting, but also in a more popular setting, to make sure that it's very clear that what we're doing is making an important distinction between the descriptive and the normative. Having said, so the popular understanding of, of personhood conflates it with the human, and that needs to be sort of, we need to be mindful of that when we're talking about extending personhood beyond the human. But it goes the other direction too. There can't be scientific proof establishing the personhood of chimpanzees, right? Because personhood is normative and conceptual, and so you can't prove it, it's not an empirical kind of claim. There can be scientific evidence that establishes certain kinds of reasons for thinking there are capacities or traits that I was talking about earlier that make it so that it's valuable, um, that those traits are associated with, with what makes us valuable and what makes an individual valuable. But it's important that we don't slip into this notion that there's scientific proof of the personhood of some non-human animal. So the rhetorical caution, that's my number one caution, the rhetorical caution um, I think is easily um, is easily remedied as long as we're clear and we're very clear with our language. And so we're always being very careful about what it is that we're saying. There are two other um, cautions that I want to raise or traps that we could fall into as we're moving um, the notion of personhood beyond the human. And one is methodological and the other is conceptual um, or normative. So the methodological point that I wanted to raise, and it is a worry, I think, um, has to do with how we actually find out what traits or capacities or abilities um, these other animals have in order to establish that they are the kinds of beings for whom we should grant greater consideration. Um, so animal, most obviously, we t uh, the mirror test was, was um, mentioned in terms of self-awareness. Um, there's all sorts of other kinds of comparative psychological experiments that have gone on, different kinds of, um, this, these, all of these experiments that you see here are, I would call, um, non-invasive but nonetheless harmful given the conditions in which these animals are kept. Um, and so what's important to think about is that most, I would say most of the work that's been done to try to establish that other animals have those valuable similar capacities that might elevate them um, to the status of person or that might warrant our expansion of the circle of moral concern tend to use those animals in ways that would be objectionable before you find out what it is that you find out. And that's true whether the experiments are in fact invasive, which most of them are. I'm not showing those, but most of them are. Many of them involve electrodes implanted in brains. Um, and in any event, most of them involve taking animals out of the conditions, the social and the environmental um, and the psychological conditions that would allow them to flourish. Now, there are exceptions. Lori Marino has a wonderful protocol for how we would do cognitive research with cetacean in the wild. Brian Hare, who works with chimpanzees and bonobos, has been a strong advocate for doing this kind of research in sanctuaries. Um, there is you know, of course, we know about cognitive um, ethology, although even though cognitive ethology has been going on for a while, there's not a lot of that. And so, you know, we have field studies in Africa of various um, great apes and this wonderful work that's being done in, um, in the West of the United States on prairie dogs. But the cognitive ethological work that one would hope 20 years ago would have really taken off as being able to establish the kind of evidence that would suggest that other animals have these certain capacities hasn't really done. So the bulk of the work um, that's done to try to determine how similar other animals are to us um, in terms of their brain, their neuroscience, and their cognition, and as well as their behaviors, are done in captivity and are often quite invasive. Okay, so you might object, well, that's true of the work that's needed to try to establish personhood, to try to figure out what it is, what capacities um, an individual has in terms of um, their cognition, but it's also true in terms of suffering. I mean, if you want to find out if this animal feels pain, um, you're going to have to cause the animal pain and, and measure various kinds of you know, biological responses. Um, and I think that uh, in some sense that that's, that's, was true. Um, I think uh, Robert Jones will talk a little bit about fish 
um, and the work that was done um, more recently. But I don't think that particularly now this is the kind of work that we need to do to figure out whether or not other animals feel pain. I think that there's a large um, enough body of literature and work to recognize that other animals suffer. And perhaps that other animals suffer is much more important than whether or not they have, um, you're kidding, okay. Um, okay, so quickly, I want to also talk then about the third conceptual or normative caution, and that is um, a caution that is primarily focused on why we're looking at similarities in the first place. Um, I wanted to just show very quickly this Povinelli um, work. This work was done to try to show whether or not chimpanzees um, in seeing no, it's, it's a whole theory of mind literature, which I was going to tell you about, but I haven't, I was just told I have two minutes, which I, I miscalculated. Um, in any event, the problem here is that when we look, at, I mean, in a nutshell, when we look at chimpanzees, not in good conditions, when we look at chimpanzees as being sort of s stronger, hairier children, and try to figure out how smart they are based on the assumption that they're similar to us, just hairier and stronger, we're going to miss a lot. And so the important lesson that we learn from years of theory of mind research, at least on that front, is that um, we need to look at these animals in their own right. They are different from us, and their differences are important in understanding um, what not just uh, what's interesting and special about these animals, but also what their needs are. Um, and so part of what I want to suggest is that in looking at looking for similarities, how we might share the same general types of intelligence or cognitive skills, the same sensitivities and vulnerabilities, the same emotional responses, we tend to obscure or overlook distinctively valuable aspects of the lives of others. We see what we want to see when we look at what they do. And so this is a slide of my friend Emma, who looks to the world, if you want to believe this, that she's fixing the hydraulic door system, which isn't a bad thing for her to be doing. But of course, that's not at all what she's doing. She's just actually doing what she just saw the hydraulic door fixer man to, um, doing. She's just mimicking what he just did. So when we focus on how much they're like us, we assimilate them. And that's my main upshot here in the conceptual caution. We assimilate them into our human-oriented framework. And we grant them consideration in virtue of what we believe they share with us, rather than what makes their lives meaningful and valuable by their own lights. And through our human-oriented perspective, our human-centered perspective, we end up reconfiguring a dualism that will inev inevitably find some other to exclude, those that are really different and from the able-bodied, able-minded persons at the center of our um, concern. So in the case of personhood beyond the human, we need to be particularly cautious that we don't construct and then ignore certain others, those humans and many non-humans who construct meaningful ways of being in the world, but who are differently able, such that they aren't seen as similar to those who occupy the human center. Thank you.